um, call, I'll call this meeting to order. This is city council work session for February 1st, 2021. Uh, Sue, a roll call, please. Um, Councillor McBride. Here. Councillor Cofield. Here. Mar Councillor Martinez Plancarte. Present. Um, Mayor Rogers. Present. Councillor Bacon. Here. Councillor Finley. Here. Uh, Mr. Mayor, six present, and I'll keep an eye out for Elise. Okay, thank you. All right, review of the council agenda and meeting. Anything on there, folks? Not seeing anything. The only thing that I might like to do, I just have a question on uh, consent calendar item 8B. It's more a procedural thing. It's, it's nothing more than that, but maybe we can just ask that question out of the consent item, if that's okay with you all. All right. Okay. And then otherwise, on to uh, council business items. Anything, folks, for this evening that's not on this agenda that you'd like to bring up or plan to bring up during the uh, work session or business session? Okay, I'm not seeing anything. On to presentations. Here we go. 5A, the 2020 Newburgh Economic Development Strategy, NED's annual report. Take it away, Shannon. There's so much to do when you start the whole sharing process, right? <laughs> uh, good evening, City Council, Mayor, and City staff. This will be a fairly straightforward presentation of the report you received in advance, which is um, a summary of activity for the Newburgh Economic Development Strategy process, actually through 2019 and 2020, wrapped into our 2020 annual report. To give you a little bit of uh, context of who's part of this economic development process, and then also to thank the people that uh, have not only created this living document, but have worked on a regular basis to implement the goals of our community. Car Bigger staff from the Shahila Valley Innovation Accelerator, um, myself formerly at the chamber and now working with the NED strategy on behalf of the city of Newburgh, Leslie Caldwell from Visit Newburgh, Taste Newburgh. Joshua Duder, Shahan Valley Chamber of Commerce, Bill H Philip Higgins, who uh, represents our real estate community, Dr. Luke, Luke Neff on behalf of Newburgh Public Schools, Molly Olson with the Downtown Coalition, soon to be Polly Peterson, actually taking over that role, Doug Rux from the city of Newburgh, and then Abisha Stone, representing SEDCOR for as our Yamhill County Economic Development Coordinator. So thank you, and it's also who worked on this. Um, as an overview, the NEDS document was originally prepared in 2016 with input for, from over 60 local, regional, and statewide organizations. Uh, we still hold monthly meetings, except in December, to update and assess our, needs pro our NEDS progress in different projects. The NEDS document has five pillars of activity, the industrial sector, commercial sector, business, and workforce development, downtown Newburgh, and then tourism and hospitality. And each strategy has identified actions and timelines. This document actually was created culturally within our community to create an accountable method for advancing on our economic development needs. And as you'll see, we started in 2016 with this process, but the event continues to evolve and change with the needs of our community. Uh, one of the biggest changes that is reflected in this report is information that we incorporated from the Newburgh Community Visioning Project, Vision Pro Project that occurred in 2019. Um, I need to make a quick adjustment to my screen. Sorry. For some reason, I'm not successfully minimizing your faces and it's hiding the text. There we go. Um, so after the community vision event, uh, the NEDS committee integrated a uh, approximately 40 updates for economic development and livability into the document. Um, five goals specifically were introduced just for economic development to enhance industrial development capabilities and commercial development capabilities to create a premier business and workforce development program, complete organizational actions for the downtown improvement plan, and increase and, increase and maintain support for tourism organizations in Newburgh. And again, these goals came directly from what our community said they wanted and needed in our economic development strategy. 
the economic development priorities specifically that went into this revision of the NEDS document to engage the Oregon Employment Department better, leverage the accelerator, conduct more retention and recruitment visits, develop regional partnerships, promote enterprise zones, more support for entrepreneurs, establish an urban renewal district, create a vertical, vertical housing development program, a construction excise tax, and then also to update downtown infrastructure, including parking and signage, continue providing visitor center functions, promote Newburgh as a tourist destination, and recruit a mid-tier hotel. The livability and development priorities that went into the revision of the document uh, included housing affordability, the downtown improvement plan, general infrastructure support, to evaluate and potentially expand the urban growth boundary to increase land inventory for business recruitment, retention, and expansion, generate data through a housing needs anal analysis and an economic opportunities study, and then of course to support completion of the Riverfront Master Plan and development of the West Rock Mill site and develop vacant downtown properties. Another revision to the document that occurred in the past two years occurred in September of 2020 when the NEDS committee con uh, convened to evaluate and or temporarily revise the strategy goals in response to the economic crisis. And I know uh, in October, it was October and November, Doug Rux on behalf of the city of Newburgh did introduce those COVID revisions and also presented those to our community partners. So I know that Doug presented to the um, Shahana Valley Chamber of Commerce Board of Directors, the Chase Newberg Board of Directors. And these are, um, these are all revisions that the community was excited about and was proud to represent to different organizations. The most visible accomplishments of our economic development response did include, of course, on behalf of the city, the creation of the Business Emergency Response Grant, and then also the Support Local Challenge to support our local businesses. And then also a, another visible effect or outcome was the creation of the economic health manager position at the city of Newburgh to focus on economic recovery, funding opportunities, business liaison opportunities, and workforce development. Other COVID-19 priorities that we see in our NED strategy, tents and heaters to support business activity and in inclement weather. The downtown coalition did a great job pulling that together. Exit interviews with businesses leaving Newburgh or closing closer monitoring uh, of changes in real estate availability, safe strategic community events. So looking at how we engage our community while still honoring the restrictions we have on gatherings, identifying and promoting funding opportunities as they continue to come about, uh, reevaluation of the working relationship between local business support organizations like the Chamber, the Downtown Coalition and Taste Newburgh, and then stronger relationships with private and public economic development partners, including SEDCOR, the Oregon Entrepreneurs Network, um, Business Oregon, any of, any of our regional and state partners. So moving to the industrial sector, there are five strategies in the NEDS document for the indu industrial sector uh, to assess the local economy by building on the four key existing traded sectors industries listed there. Also retention and expansion of existing industrial businesses, recruitment of traded sector companies participate, uh, to participate and partner with regional, state and federal organizations, and then to market the competitive advantage in Newburgh. And for the council's reference, this presentation is, a, a, um, it's simply the condensed language in the narrative report that you all received. And that has also been published on our website and is available for public record as well. So if I skip through some of these points, it's because it's a long PowerPoint, there's a lot to cover and um, you have the information ready to go. So within those five strategies, this was the develop we saw, development or the progress that we saw in the past two years. We saw a new community profile through the community visioning program. We were able to uh, complete our workforce housing needs survey uh, we made significant progress on the business retention and expansion survey, which should be um, administered in 2021. We also were able to set clear economic development goals for the postponed delegation to Police Europe Austria. That trip was supposed to be last September. We know it's somewhere in the future when travel is again safe. We were able to investigate um, or started investigating CRM software to create a better record of contacts that we have with local businesses or business owners about development, infill, uh, recruitment, or 
um, expansion opportunities, even to record elements of uh, customer service or internal processes where we have opportunities to better serve our, our business customers. We also identified a lack of available land. Uh, actually, that's the biggest obstacle for many of our economic development strategies. We began preparation for remediation, recruitment, and development for the West Rock Mill site, which has been purchased by CDC Incorporated and moves forward. We made significant progress, progress toward an urban renewal plan, and then we held several industry and partner forums around uh, traded sector vertical integration or other industrial opportunities. Within the commercial sector, we have three strategies to retain existing commercial and retail businesses in Newburgh to redevelop vacant and underutilized commercial and retail sites and to support the creation of new retail and commercial businesses. Our progress for our annual report, uh, again, we have the, the BRE survey developed and ready to employ. We had a greater focus on relief funding, state guidance, PPE needs, and supporting alternative business models, which is another way to say we took a closer look at how to help businesses pivot their models to adjust to namely the pandemic. Uh, we had the construction excise tax adopted by city council, a very successful 2020 farmers market, downtown inventory list created and is still maintained, although that's a moving target. Um, takes a lot of, it's always shifting. We also um, engaged in economic opportunity analysis as in support of a buildable lands inventory. And then we had several one-on-one -on -one conversations with business owners for expansion and recruitment purposes. Within business and workforce development, we have seven strategies, foster entrepreneurial business formation and growth, maintain the accelerator, enhance the business mix in downtown Newburgh, improve workforce development, enhance the Chamber of Commerce's resources, market employment training opportunities to employers, and create a business financing program. We have a couple pages of updates because this is such a dense strategy uh, section for the NEDS document. Uh, successes or progress that we made, we did host a COVID uh, minority certification event with Business Oregon and COVID is a state program that helps certify uh, businesses owned by cultural or racial minorities, women, service disabled veterans or emerging businesses in two categories, less than three years in operation and less than five years in operations. And we did have several of our businesses qualify for certification from that event. We partnered with Public Health for free PPE distribution to local businesses. Uh, we, uh, we had several members of our NED strategic effort who were involved in coordination of COVID-19 information relief efforts, including advocacy design support for several grants through Business Oregon, the Yamhill County Board of Commissioners, and the City of Newburgh. Uh, Yamhill County now has its first venture catalyst through the Oregon Entrepreneur Network. Um, and Mike White there has secured more than $45,000 in investor funds for entrepreneurial startup opportunities. And then also uh, Sedcor did a great job, Abisha there, uh, securing $400,000 in funds through an economic development and uh, through, the, through an ADA grant for an ag innovation hub and ag is short for agricultural. Also, um, I'm sorry, that's a repeat. Um, the Shehima Valley Innovation Accelerator has increased its client service and is now at full capacity. Uh, the Chamber of Commerce developed a video marketing project for traded sector workforce needs. Project Oasis was developed to address childcare needs for workforce. And now actually we are moving forward with five total childcare projects in Yamhill County. The school district hired a full-time post-secondary success coordinator, which includes um, working with students for all avenues of success after high school, included apprenticeships and trade schools. And then the school district also passed a $141 million construction bond, which includes several CTE projects. CTE is uh, career and technical education. So it's traded sector skilled workforce, uh, specialized workforce. 
Uh, we also have stronger partnerships with, McMinnville, with the McMinnville Works Internship Program for youth in Yamhill County, and um, that's through MEDP, excuse me, the McMinnville Economic Development Partnership, but they do serve the entire county now, and they developed a, a sub-program that serves high school students, not just the typical internship categories of 18 to 24-year-olds. We have continued engagement with Innovate Oregon for CTE support. A full-time economic health manager was hired by the city of Newburgh for expansion of workforce development programs. Newburgh Perk Professional De Development Series was launched with six, sorry, with nine sessions, um, elevating local business leaders as mentors. And then uh, the chamber made progress toward the formation of a foundation to increase revenue potential and the visitor center was relocated downtown. For the downtown Newburgh uh, component or pillar, we have seven strategies to create an urban renewal district, create an economic or business improvement district, create tools for developments, complete regulatory improvements, complete downtown partnerships, create the downtown development ombudsperson position and developing uh, develop a parking management plan. Progress or developments. We did make significant progress toward an urban renewal district, including uh, council approval of an urban renewal feasibility plan that moves forward. Council adopted a construction excise tax. We have significant preparation for a vertical housing development zone. The council also voted in support of uh, the Newburgh Public Arts Committee. We do have delays in parking studies until traffic patterns reflect commerce, tourist, uh, commerce tourism events and regular college traffic because we've seen a significant disruption we don't know what our regular parking needs are because we have fewer people parking. Um, and we expect that will be temporary. For tourism and hospital hospitality, we have four strategies to develop a vision for Newburgh as a tourist destination, increase and maintain support for tourism organizations in Newburgh, increase tourist and visitor counts in Newburgh, and then continue the transient lodging tax program. Developments, um, Taste Newburgh, Visit Newburgh, of course, was formed and had a successful Im implementation of a Wake Up and Wine Country campaign, several projects with Travel, Yam Hill, Forbes, Seattle Magazine, KGW, KBTV, Fox 12, and other smaller media outlets. There was a uh, lavender season promotion, promotion of wildfire recovery efforts, including local businesses who helped out. A marketing and branding agency was contracted and Case Newberg also hired a marketing manager. They launched a new website with tracking metrics, social media messaging and blogs, and the tourism messages were adjusted for safety and local focus after COVID-19. Finally, in evaluation of the 2020 council goals, here's how your Newburgh economic development strategy aligns with what the council um, would like to establish in our community. Goal number one, to change the operational culture to one focus on customer service and act to resolve ongoing legal disputes. Uh, several business and workforce development strategies focus on greater efficiency between support organizations and within the city of Newburgh. We recognize that business owners are customers of the city. The NED's priorities proactively support starting or expanding a business in Newburgh, navigating different departments within the city of Newburgh, accessing or accessing resources at all levels of government and improving city rapport with the business community. Goal number two, to further develop an operational culture that adopts and cherishes diversity, equity, and inclusion as core values. Uh, the workforce development initiatives focus on improving quality of life and vocational prospects for individuals, especially our underemployed workers. CTE programming and entrepreneurial support. Uh, we're exposing our students to meaningful living wage careers that could empower them to both live and work locally, particularly our highest risk and non-traditional students who might not see traditional post-secondary higher education models as the best options after high school. The workforce and affordable housing initiatives improve equitable access for, vul for vulnerable community members. With the adoption of the construction excise tax, we begin to build a reserve fund to augment diverse housing options. Also, within both our urban renewal planning conversations and our vertical housing initiative, city staff has begun addressing issues of gentrification and displacement of the community and, uh, and stakeholder input. The NED's partner organizations are working to better engage the Latinx community and with parking sidewalks and infrastructure improvements, of course, through urban renewal and other programs, we're also able to improve ADA accessibility standards. Goal number three, to promote development of housing affordability, such as houselessness, tra transitional housing, and workforce housing. 
We have our workforce housing forums, vertical housing program, and construction excise tax all support affordable, diverse housing options for our community, and the urban renewal plan and citywide development strategies support infill opportunities. Goal number four, to create and support an urban renewal plan and authority. Uh, that was a uh, specifically named goal for several of the NED strategies. So it's no surprise, development of an urban renewal plan is a significant priority in downtown Newburgh improvement plan. Completion and implementation of the plan is expected to occur in 2021. I'm not saying it will be done in 2021, it won't, but it will move forward. And goal number five, to collaborate with local partners and with entities like ICLEI in the development of a sustainability program. Uh, infill strategies with the vertical housing program and urban renewal area allow our community to leverage land resources locally and the city of Newburgh's community development public works and planning teams are able to increase sustainability standards including reclaimed stormwater more efficient utilities and ADA accessibility with development opportunities. Finally, our 2021 NEDS goals, um, parking solutions for downtown Newburgh, as we mentioned, Reevaluation of the function of a visitor center and the working relationship between the chamber, Taste Newburgh, and the downtown coalition. A relaunch of tourism marketing post COVID 19. The urban renewal plan finalized, adopted, and implementation begun. Redevelopment of the West Rock Mill site and implementation of the waterfront master plan to increase industrial and commercial opportunities. Entrepreneurial support. Uh, to continue identifying funding opportunities and then workforce development around housing, childcare, retention, and recruitment. I now defer back to the City Council for any questions or comments. All right, folks, you, you heard it. Questions or comments? And I can't necessarily see, so give me a hand raise. There's one, Stephanie, thank you. Yeah, I just want to say I really appreciated this and it felt so thorough to me and I particularly um, was really encouraged by how thorough you touched on each one of the council goals. Um, that's really obviously what is important to us um, at the council and I appreciate sort of um, paying attention to how the work sort of coincides with those goals. Um, because I know a lot of this work is often um, underappreciated and um, not as visible to the public as um, some other pieces of work that the city does. So um, I really appreciate all of this. Um, in particular, I appreciate the, the, um, the DEI aspects um, and hitting uh, several populations within that DEI instead of just focusing on um, either our Spanish speaking community or our uh, disability community, but sort of implementing it for everyone. So thank you very much. Thank you, Councillor Finley. Um, anyone else, any other comments? Show me your hands. Okay. All right, I do not see any other. Oh, there we go, Mike, there you go. So as far as the traffic, uh, as far as the traffic study goes, is means I'm kind of new at this. Is there a, is there a, a plan in uh, to think about how to maybe get more of the trucks off of the downtown corridor um, and maybe make more of a requirement that unless they're actually delivering something downtown uh, area to the businesses, what are we what are we going to do to get them to maybe go on the bypass so that it reduces the trucks downtown. That's a is great that question. Part, is that part of your is that part of your strategy or if not, I, I apologize. I thank you for that question, Councillor McBride. I appreciate it. Um, the next step in the parking assessment is actually to do a parking assessment and to see what the challenges are for downtown parking and uh, walkability and access to our downtown businesses. And so in that process we'll be able to collect data that may identify and agree with the crux of your question, you know, are the larger trucks damaging the downtown experience for, for the goals that our community has, has for what that would look like. If that ends up being a direction that we need to move in, that the data supports that it is disruptive, we have strong uh, city staff relationships and advocacy relationships with the Parkway Committee, which uh, works for the development of the bypass, if that's a solution. And we have other options too, just in how we might uh, recon reconfigure downtown traffic flow or different opportunities. Um, and that would interface really nicely with the urban renewal plan as well. 
Does that answer your question, Counselor? Yeah, that's that's fine for right now. Thank you. If I could just follow on on that, one one thing also is that um, you know it'd be nice to ban all the trucks, you know, uh, and even if it was local traffic only. But unfortunately, that I don't believe is impossible because of ODOT's requirements because it is state highways, right? And and people, you know, coming through to head to Carlton or wherever they're going. So unfortunately, um, we're going to have to live with them to a certain degree. I think so. Any other questions for Shannon? Yeah, Mike. Was it? Well, I just wanted to follow up maybe a little bit. Is there? I mean, at one time there was talk a long time ago about maybe have a Hancock be an east-west where traffic coming from the west or heading uh, to the east would just for, would just go downtown if that would be your own reason for going there and then have east-west traffic on Hancock and then it takes a lot of that burden off of the downtown core. That was actually a study that was done back in early 2000 that the city paid for and I don't know where it's at now but that was a recommendation back then well I missed the part up I missed the question I I understand I understand the comment I, I I guess the question was um have we looked at something like that or maybe is that going to be part of the process um, I think thank you. I can probably jump in a little bit. Um, you know, I think what we're looking at in terms of the immediate plan is is really a, a traffic study. Is is really I'm sorry, a parking study, not not a traffic study, not necessarily. Oh, okay. um, right. you know, looking at the um, the trucks, I think bypass phase two is our best option for what you're talking about. So um, that's where we're going to need advocacy to, you know, sure that that comes out of the ground and, and helps, we hope with, or helps, we think with what will, uh, result, you know, once that's built out. So I think the bypass phase two is our best hope for moving the trucks that aren't doing business in downtown out of downtown. And what we're really funding or planning to fund is a parking study. Got it. Okay. All right. Other questions or comments for, uh, go ahead, Bryce. Yeah, uh, again, Shannon, thank you so much. I echo uh, Stephanie's comments, uh, great thorough work. It also was a really good reminder. I was like, oh yeah, <laughs> I remember doing that. I remember doing that. Um, so thank you, yes, for, for that reminder. Um, isn't a question so much as um, a comment. So um, I saw in the report, oh gosh, it was mentioned in a couple of places. I'm on um, the document. Oh, well, of course I just clicked out. This is the... Uh, yeah, 2019-2020 NEDS annual report cover letter. Um, and it's also in the graph table that you provided. So in terms of the um, relationship working with George Fox and the Newburgh School District, love it, brilliant idea. Um, and I know that there were challenges around transitions in terms of who you're working with. I know Jesse was the, the point person for a minute and now you're working with Kyle. Um, in those conversations, and maybe this is more so for Doug, so you can relate to him, um, have Kyle be sure to connect with the Intercultural Resource Center, right? So, and again, especially as this is noted under the goals around um, DEI, uh, there are really good connections that I know Kyle already has to the Intercultural Resource Center and students there who you could work with um, on some of these, some of these initiatives. Excellent. Uh, thank you, Councillor Cofield. I made a note to file up. So we actually, even in the past 60 days, have two additional economic development uh, representatives engaging with city and local organizations from the university. So we have Kyle Dickinson. Um, Sean Daly is also working on business engagement and outreach. And okay. then Sarah Remy is uh, oh, yeah. working with city staff to engage George Fox alumni who yeah. are career uh, career people or business owners in the community to make sure that we have better communication and coordination of services, but thank you. Yeah, no, nah, Sarah's good people. All right, other questions or comments, folks? Again, show of hands. Okay, I don't see any. Three, two, one, I don't see any. All right, Shannon, thank you very, very much. Good luck in all your future endeavors. All right. Um, next on our agenda, we've got uh, youth presentation on committee changes. So here we go. I think uh, Colin, is that you? And Sue and Dan, I believe. So yes, it is. Right. Here we are. Um, Sue, if you could pull up the presentation, I would be appreciative. 
Thank you. Okay, so um, this presentation is, is a continuation of the proposal that was put forth at the December 7th meeting of the City Council during the business session. Um, so if you go to the next slide, please. Thank you. Um, we're also taking feedback from the January 19th session. Um, just some various input that was given at that point as well. Um, basically, what we're doing here is we are seeking further input in order to find out what we're doing for our next steps. Um, how exactly we're going to implement this is going to respond to some feedback um, that was received during those meetings and uh, just uh, ways to approach it going forward. So next slide, please. Um, so of course we can't really start any change to the committee system without a legislative uh, legislative amendments. So there's two ways we could do this. The first of which is we could amend and create legislation for um, existing committees. This would involve creating uh, two ordinances to amend the membership of the library board and the uh, uh, citizens rate review committee. Um, because those are set forth in the new municipal code, those would require ordinances and would take 30 days to take effect after the date of passage. And this would also require um, resolutions to amend the membership of ad hoc committees and the affordable housing commission. Um, those would take uh, effect more or less immediately. Um, however, the, the impact of the ordinances would move the timeline for implementation into, uh, will pass June 1st. And what we're aiming for is a June 1st implementation so that we can give uh, potential new student commissioners a full year term as are currently available to the current positions. In order to facilitate that, um, it's recommended that we take the second approach. And that would be a temporary single resolution to amend the, uh, just to add positions to current committees and would more or less kick the can down the line for uh, permanent changes to, re to legislation that uh, adopt, that uh, establishes the committees. Um, it's not a permanent fixture, but uh, it would get the job done by June 1st and it would also allow any changes set forth by the uh, proposed subcommittee that will be addressed later tonight, I believe. Um, uh, it would allow any proposals made by that subcommittee to be included in further legislation. Um, so that goes over the legislative challenges we're facing. Um, next slide, please. So now we're really diving into the feedback that was received by uh, that was received from council uh, during the last couple of meetings. So. The first thing we want to do when we add student positions, or if we add student positions, is we want to make sure that we are getting di a diverse group of uh, volunteers. Um, there are a few obstacles to achieving that, however, the first of which is access to technology. So because of the pandemic, as we're doing right now, the meetings are held virtually, which means that students who don't necessarily have access to uh, laptops or other digital devices that facilitate uh, virtual meetings they would be uh, excluded under normal conditions from volunteering. So uh, in meetings with uh, the mayor, with Sue and with other uh, student volunteers, we came up with a few ideas. The first of which was partnering with the library. However, because of staffing difficulties that are currently present with the library, and that is more or less unfeasible. So the, the approach that we think would work best would be to partner with the school district. Um, the school district already uh, gives Chromebooks to students who need them in order to facilitate their studies. Therefore, if we work with the school district to expand the possible uses to uh, virtual meetings as we're doing right now, that would be a, a quick and cost efficient way to bridge that uh, technological divide. And then the second obstacle that we're facing in order to ensure um, just overall diversity in our representation is incentives for working students. A major concern expressed at the December 7th meeting and at the January 19th meeting was how do we make sure that the opportunity costs for volunteering aren't so high that we are excluding um, less advantaged students. Um, at the January 19th meeting, um, meal vouchers were one proposal. Another proposal was uh, child care or sibling care in the case of most students. Um, those could be easily applied to student volunteers as well. Um, but if uh, we, if uh, more direction is given by the council to exploring those, uh, to exploring potential um, financial incentives, 
even though our ability to give direct financial incentives is limited due to uh, Oregon volunteer law and community organization laws, um, we could explore those avenues in order to make sure that we are making it as inclusive possible as possible, as, as inclusive process as possible, excuse me. Um, next slide, please, Sue. So then we have other considerations to ensure diversity and representation. Um, under current legislation for the committees that do have student commissioners, um, it's stated that the, the positions will be made available to students of all local schools and colleges. So uh, with the schools that are currently in the Newburgh area, that includes Newburgh High School, Veritas, C.S. Lewis, and George Fox and Portland Community College. So on the administrative end, we would have to decide um, what is the proportion of positions that we want to give to students from each institution? Um, the, currently, all positions are held by Newburgh uh, high school students. But if we uh, add positions to existing committees, that would make approximately five new positions for a total of eight. So we would have to figure out what proportion we would want uh, of those seats filled with students from each institution. The current ratio that we are working with theoretically at the moment is approximately 50 to 75% from Newburgh High School and the remaining uh, percentage split between the private schools and the colleges. Um, the second consideration that we have to make, uh, other consideration we have to make is for students of different backgrounds, how do we make sure that's, that opportunities are given to students of all the communities that are present in Newburgh? Um, and the main way we do that is by um, working through the organizations that are already present in the schools um, to advertise the opportunities that are available. So working in uh, at the high school, for instance, um, the ASB, the GSA, um, Mecca, those would include uh, Latinx students, um, LGBTQ students. Um, just we're trying to find ways to make sure that we have, that we are trying to recruit um, students who have, an, who have an interest in leadership or are a part of diverse communities so that we can further strengthen the way that Newburgh's um, legislative processes are aided by these volunteers. Um, students of different career paths at the December 7th meeting, uh, concerns were brought up of, okay, if we add these positions, they are most likely going to be most attractive to uh, students who are college bound. We wanna make sure that we give plenty of opportunities to students who are career bound, however. How do we do that? Um, internships are likely the best way of accomplishing that. Um, we would have to work with staff in order to in order to figure out what can be the scope and breadth of these internships and how can we facilitate them either during the school year or throughout the entire year. Um, it is an op it is an option, but we would need further direction from staff in order to figure out um, or order to pursue exactly how we're going to go about implementing these internships. And then the last other consideration is students on all committees. So. Um, if we set a proportion of students, if we set a proportion of positions which are made available to students of a given institution, Newark High School, George Fox, Portland Community College, um, and those positions aren't filled by the, uh, by the designation that we make for it. Say we designate a position for um, Veritas and it's not filled. If we designate a position for Newark High School and it's not filled, we would have to have protocols in place to make sure that we can um, expand the availability of those positions to students who do not fit within the designation um, in a way that is timely for the appointment process. Right now we're working on about a 60 day appointment process um, between applications and selections. And we would have to make sure that we can uh, shift gears quickly enough within that period to make sure that we can uh, fill all the positions that are available. Another consideration we often ask, we also have to make on this topic is that uh, some positions are naturally more attractive than others. Um, the Planning Commission, for example, meets monthly, whereas the Traffic Safety Commission, for example, meets quarterly. Um, ad hoc committees are, have varying terms and varying meeting dates. Um, so the opportunity for engagement differs by committees and therefore the, the um, interest that will be exhibited by uh, prospective volunteers will likely differ as well. So we would have to implement some sort of system, perhaps a rank choice application where we say, or where we ask students to tell us um, which committee would you like to apply for first and foremost? And then we, uh, if that position is filled, how can we make sure that all of our other uh, opportunities are uh, seized upon 
by prospective applicants. Uh, next slide, please, Sue. Um, and then the last slide, the last sort of administrative challenges we have to go over are incentives for student participation. So um, there are always going to be concerns when we try and expand volunteering opportunities that um, the positions won't be seized upon. Um, at the school district, for example, there is a position available for students on the school board that hasn't been filled for a while. Um, the, uh, the, the ability of the city to fill student positions has been limited in the past due to a number of factors. And so we have to work uh, both in terms of advertising and in terms of incentives in order to make sure that the positions are filled when, if, we, if we can make them more available. So we, have, we already have some intrinsic incentives um, in the volunteer system. So serving on, uh, uh, serving on committees obviously is a good, uh, good uh, point of interest for college resumes, for uh, ap college applications for resumes. Um, the experience you gain while volunteering is valuable to a number of different uh, pursuits in other fields, excuse me. <clears throat> um, but we also have to make sure that there are additional incentives available um, to ensure that we are filling those positions. Um, at the December 7th meeting, excuse me, at the December 7th meeting, um, a, the possibility of a student volunteer intern of the year award, um, that was proposed, something that just increases the prestige more or less of these positions. Um, in sh yeah, in short, we just need uh, further direction from the council in order to figure out what incentives should we pursue and how should we go about pursuing them in order to further market these positions and make them attractive to potential applicants. Uh, next slide, please, Sue. So then timeline. Um, right now we're meeting uh, to give further, to receive further input and to get next steps, uh, more direction. Um, later in the meeting, as I stated previously, there is going to be discussion on the potential subcommittee to discuss the overall committee system. This uh, student proposal is just uh, one idea out of 10 that were proposed um, in order to uh, improve the city's broader system of committees and volunteers. So um, input from later tonight and uh, as and the subcommittee as it goes forward could be uh, incorporated into further action on this specific idea. So then um, after tonight uh, and go and through February, um, city staff will be meeting uh, with uh, individuals from schools and other institutions that we've discussed in order to build the relationships which are necessary to advertise positions to students. Um, again, we're trying to go to the students where they are to make sure that we are not inhibiting, um, or to, rather to make sure that students who uh, would like to apply know that they have the opportunity to do so. Um, going in, excuse me, going into March, um, we will complete draft legislation uh, and, we, and uh, hopefully calendar the presentation of that legislation um, to the city council on March 15th. If that legislation passes going into March and eight, uh, rest of March and April, um, the community, we will start work with the community engagement specialists to further market the positions. And beginning in April, we will begin the process of engaging and recruiting students um, for uh, appointments by June 1st. That process will continue through May um, with the applicate, with the, the recruitment and, and selection period. So that hopefully by June 1st, um, we will have a, a recognition event and the actual appointment of more students to all the possible positions. Um, we already discussed this in the December 7th meeting, but as a matter of clarity, uh, council goals, um, this meets uh, goals uh, one, two, and five. So customer service ongoing legal disputes, um, increasing the representation of Newburgh's uh, system of committees uh, will uh, improve the ability of the city to meet customers uh, to meet the needs of the city's residents. Um, number two, diversity, equity, inclusion, obviously um, increasing the, the availability of positions to students of diverse backgrounds and younger voices on the committee on uh, in the committee system uh, will increase the diversity and representation that we see in our uh, committee system and in our legislation that has moved through that system. And then number five, sustainability. 
Um, it's not necessarily environmental, but making sure that we have a number of uh, young leaders in the community who are capable of uh, facilitating action as time goes forward will lead to the human sustainability of the city. Um, so that's it concludes this presentation. I now turn it over to the council for uh, feedback and uh, any questions you may have. All right, folks. Um, well, Colin, um, I think people, not, I'm not normally one to gush. Like that's, that's not my style, but uh, I gotta tell you, my friend, that was, uh, that was fantastic. Um, you're gonna go places and I'm gonna tell you, right, you, you better keep us in touch as to where you're going after this senior year of high school and what you're gonna do because um, that was fantastic. So anyway, um, one question for you. As, if I recall, I think it's library, CRC, CRC, and affordable housing. Are those the ones that we're currently missing students or do we have others? Um, so currently the only committees which have student positions are the Planning Commission, the Traffic Safety Commission, and the Historical Preservation Commission. That leaves all the ad hocs, um, the Citizens Rate Review Committee, the Library Board, and the Affordable Housing Commission uh, without student positions. Okay, thank you. All right, Stephanie. The mayor beat me to it, but this is amazing. This really is um, a lot of work and it was um, really impressive. And so thank you for doing this because this is sort of a dream come true that you put a whole bunch of work into and uh, we didn't have to. So I'm really excited about this. And I know people have probably already all heard this, but um, I first started being um, interested in city government when I was in high school and I was an intern for um, the city of Hood River and it um, ended up being a job for me while I was in college. So I think um, this is really um, something that gives back to our community in ways that um, we don't often see and also is a way for us to get a lot out of um, what the community has to offer. So thank you so much for doing this. Hey, Jules. Thank you. Thank you again, Colin, for all the amazing work that you've done. It's, you know, you definitely show us like, I'm like, I, I, there was no way I was like you in high school. Like you're just at another level, but you know, that's kudos to you. Uh, the one thing that, um, you know, you asked us about suggestions, for example, for like a monetary stipend or something like that, Dan, and maybe this is more of a question for you, but besides like food, are, is, is the city in any way able to provide like I don't know, like five dollar uh, Dutch gift cards or anything like that. That's not like a huge, you know, amount, but something a little bit more minimal or raffle like a, you know, a card here or there to a local business or so. I think I might defer to James on that, but I, I would think yes is probably the answer. We can find ways to do it uh, as long as it is below a certain threshold of, of dollar amount. Um, and I would think based on what you're just saying, yeah, we can find a way to do that. I, I concur with Dan that as long as that threshold stays, you know, at that low, um, kind of five, ten dollar level. Bryce. Yeah, uh, Colin, wonderful job. Uh, echo everyone's sentiments. Uh, absolutely incredible. I was thinking about James's comment around like five to 10. I like getting money to the people. <laughs> Give all the money to all the people. Um, so, you know, of course, legally what, what we can do. Um, a few thoughts and comments. Uh, Colin, you mentioned, so this idea of interest, I think is, is significant. Um, you pointing out that the school board, right, has had a vacancy um, for quite some time really stood out to me. And um, I think it yeah, is a really good example of some challenges that we would have um, with recruiting students. If I read your report correctly, you are recommending, right, that we adopt the second alternative, right, which is to draft or to accept legislation that you draft that would effectively require one student representative on each of the committees. Is, is that correct? Um, I wouldn't exactly be drafting it due to legal considerations, but uh, yes. Uh, yeah. That for the two sense. reasons I listed in my presentation, yeah. um, timeline cons timeline considerations and uh, making sure that we can incorporate the suggestions of the potential future subcommittee into any uh, permanent legislation. Um, that second alternative is probably the most yeah. uh, beneficial. 
no, that I agree with you. I think that that makes sense. You'd made a comment around um, potentially creating a ranked dynamic in the application because some would be more attractive than others. And you mentioned time. So some that meet monthly, some that meet quarterly, ad hoc committees, so on and so forth. Um, could you maybe clarify what you mean by that? Uh, because I can see like for some they're like oh it's only quarterly so I can do it not have to meet as much so that becomes a draw whereas others may be like oh I want to meet a lot because I'm really into it so what in your opinion um, do you think actually draws students in more is it more consistent meeting or more sort of spacious uh, spaciousness between meetings um, that is a consideration I actually hadn't taken into account of uh, student just differences with individual students um, if I am correct in my assessment of the of the body of students who would be interested, however, um, it is it would be primarily about uh, long term interest. Mm -hmm. um, so the ad hocs, for example, I think would be would particularly suffer from just having one option available because yeah. um, the the students who are likely to apply to these positions are going to be college bound. Yeah. So we have the internship uh, side for career bound students, college bound students are more likely to pursue these the committee positions. Yeah, so then. in the college application process, as, as I'm sure most of you know, um, long term commitment is something that you want to demonstrate. So yeah. going to permanent committees and um, I believe the maximum legislation is a three year as uh, three consecutive one year terms for students. Um, so being able to demonstrate that level of commitment is something that students would like to do. So the ad hocs would particularly suffer. And then yeah. going on to the rank choice part of it, as you asked, what would that look like? Um, on the current application, for example, um, students fill out, they, there's one check that they are, they're, they're able to make. Which committee would you like to apply for? Uh, here are the questions that we'd like you to answer. Um, it's just one check. Um, yeah. Changing that to a one, two, three, four system is you know something as simple as that, where the selection committee or uh, as, as it currently would happen, it would be the mayor deciding. Um, but as I'm sure the mayor would like to do, it'd be a move more to a committee system. Um, that would be something the committee could take into account in order to make sure not only that we are filling the ad hoc positions, but that um, students are, the, the students are getting the opportunities that they, they can yeah. have. No, that's, that's super helpful. Thank you. Uh, so that's a couple of thoughts. I know in our last meeting, you talked about the development of a subcommittee to talk about committees, the most government thing ever. Um, so I imagine a lot of this feedback, right, can be taken to the subcommittee as they think about what does it mean to engage students. Um, yeah, last couple of thoughts. You mentioned wonderful groups, right? You have Mecha, um, GSA, things like that. There is a newly formed Black Student Union, I believe. Um, so that would be another group to take into account when, and this is not so much for you, Colin, but for, you know, the community and subcommittees um, to work with. I think there could be a really interesting conversation between the city and GFU around uh, an MOU or a, 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 was it, memorandum of understanding that might say, hey, if a student who has X, Y, or Z sort of GPA that is involved in the city committees for X, Y, Z sort of years can be um, sort of provisionally admitted or have early priority, something like that. That could also be a way of incentivizing participation, particularly for college bound students to know that like not only does it look good on the resume, but it actually could like be the first step towards an automatic sort of admitting to George Fox, right? And I could see that it would benefit the university because they love bringing in local students. So I think that could be something else to look at. The last thing you mentioned, um, for those that are more career pathways, they have internships. I'd be curious what the mechanisms are at the high school to allow for these experiences to potentially count towards internship credit, right? That could be another way of, of incentivizing participation that doesn't necessarily come, come down to costs. Again, great work. Keep grinding. I'm excited to see, um, yeah, where life takes you as well. All right, any, any other comments? All right, uh, seeing none. All right, Colin, well, you have spurred us into reviewing not just youth participation, but the entire committee structure, which uh, as you know, we will be making the subcommittee to study committees as Bryce eloquently pointed out uh, during the business session this evening. So um, again, thank you so tremendously much 
Let us know where you're going next. Do not forget to let us know. We actually, once the subcommittee comes into play, we may well, um, you know, sort of call on you for a couple, you know, additional thoughts and how we continue to proceed. So um, I would be more than happy to be involved. Thank you. Awesome. Well, thank you. Thank you so much. Rick, can I say one, one last thing real sure. quick? Um, yes, like Rick said, let us know where you go. Also, and perhaps more importantly, let us know how we can help you get there, right? You're, all, you're here serving, putting in a whole lot of labor for the city. It's only right that if we can help get you to where you're trying to go, we do that as well, right? So please, you know, reach out to me and other counselors if we can help you get to go, if we can help you get to where you're, you're trying to go as well. Thank you so much. I'm grateful, grateful for the support. Right, and if you plan to run to, for governor when you come back from college, just let us know and we'll, uh, we'll be all over it. So there you go. All right, thank you, Colin. All right, folks, otherwise, um, let's see, let's go, let's adjourn the work session and reconvene the business session at 7.05, if that'll work for y'all. We'll see if you are ready, if Sue, if you are ready. I am ready, Councillor McBride. All right. Here. There he is. Councillor Cofield. Hey there. Uh, Councillor Yardell Holloman. Uh, Councillor Martinez Plancarte. Here. Um, Councillor or Mayor Rogers. Present. Councillor Bacon. Here. Councillor Finn. Here. Mr. Mayor, all present. Thank you very much. All right. The Pledge of Allegiance, please. All right. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God indivisible with liberty and justice for all. Okay, thank you. So without further ado, let's move into the city manager's report. Good evening, Dan. Oh, before I before we start that, this is now Dan's anniversary month. One year with the city of Newburn. So thank you, Dan. You've survived one year. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> thank you yeah and i'm uh end of the month is is my anniversary so i, I feel like i still got a month so don't oh, okay. we don't want to jinx right. it yet <laughs> yeah, don't, yeah, don't, don't jinx it no i uh i actually uh experienced what part of the the report is uh experiencing something that i have not uh, really experienced unfortunately since i got here mainly because of covid and i uh, just wanted to provide an update um that the department heads and i attended a, a conference we actually had a, uh, an educational opportunity and, um, you know, it was one of those things I didn't realize how much I was missing out and, uh, you know, kind of being able to geek out on local government stuff was uh, really nice for us. Um, so we attended the Strategic Government Resources or SGR uh, Serving Leadership Conference, which is an annual conference that the folks at SGR put on focused on servant leadership as a philosophy and really trying to embed that in local government and uh, folks who serve communities. And so uh, two day events um, highlighted by uh, you know, a lot of really great speakers, but highlighted by uh, former uh, Secretary of Defense and uh, General uh, James Mattis and uh, him talking about his book, uh, kind of uh, his experiences on the battlefield and how they relate to leadership and, and those kinds of things. And so we'd uh, done the read uh, of the book ahead of time and uh, were able to kind of go through a couple of days worth of his presentation along with all the others. And so just wanted to kind of talk really briefly about what they talked about, because again, I think I was starved for, um, you know, intellectual content, but also, um, you know, a little bit of uh, fill in the bucket of, of servant leadership, really, and, and thinking about how important that is as a concept uh, for local government leaders. Um, so some of the speakers, just a, a quick roundup of what they talked about, uh, the importance of relationships and really uh, at the organizational level and the community level, how important it is to build relationships well in advance of needing them. You know, you build your network before you need it because it's too late when you need it to build it. Um, and the importance of doing that in a disaster, actually, uh, natural disaster in this case, uh, the presenter talked about uh, working for the city of Dayton, Ohio, and um, having uh, some tornadoes come through that devastated that community and how uh, by mapping some of the areas of inequity, they were able to also really use a mapping tool to demonstrate how it had a disproportionate, uh, that natural disaster had a disproportionate impact on uh, communities of color and 
uh, those who are already impacted. Um, and so just talking about some of the ways that that community recovered, but also the lessons learned around um, convening as a local government and working collaboratively with uh, regional partners. Um, fostering a culture of engagement uh, within your, in your organization through um, kind of the, this is the geeky part, the, uh, through clear outcomes, employing uh, talents and, and putting people in the right places to succeed and then a coaching culture. So um, I think squarely in the customer service uh, ongoing um, you know, resolution, uh, goal number one, uh, area of really building a culture that we can be proud of and that really is one that's improving constantly um, that we're able to uh, not just put people in places that they have a fit but really coach them for fit too and so just some really good takeaways there um, the importance of caring for uh, communities emotional infrastructure um, and this one's a little bit interesting and I, I'm kind of looking for cringing on your faces, but um, it's the idea of, um, you know, building something where, you know, you can build infrastructure like a road or a bridge or, or something like that, but you don't always think about how people use it or, or what they feel when they're, they're using it, but also the idea that um, it's important to think about those spaces for people to gather and to have actual community rather than just paving streets or, you know, doing the things that we really need to do, but also, you know, balancing that, I guess, with the emotional needs of our community as well. So, you know, a little bit out of the box um, for some folks, but it was just really interesting presentation there as well. Um, we talked about uh, focusing on tr building trust and, and uh, transforming uh, hearts of the folks in the community that you're engaging with. Again, kind of back to that idea of uh, relationship building but relationship building with the goal of peacemaking and positive uh, role modeling and modeling uh, within the organization internally and externally. So, you know, the uh, sort of talk about the ideas of, you know, you get the behaviors you support. And, um, you know, if we really support positive rather than negative mindsets, you know, we start to have a more positive overall uh, environment around us. Um, and then lastly, uh, you know, kind of the idea of building an inclusive culture um, and ways to do that where everybody belongs and uh, where, you know, people are welcome to participate. And that presentation was awesome, but also so dense that I'm actually looking forward to getting the slide deck and rereading it because there was so much content there that was amazing. Um, and the speaker really did a great job. Um, but anyway, I, you know, just wanted to, to share, I guess, that moment of geek and really the importance of feeding some of that for us, um, you know, not just, um, you know, I think it's important generally, but I think that the idea that we're feeding the brains and the uh, hearts of our staff is so important in COVID, especially, you know, where we're not able to do this in person, but we're also, you know, it's important that, that everybody is continuing to sharpen their saw and uh, really provide the best service possible. So just wanted to kind of spend a little bit of extra time on that, um, you know, two day conference that we did last week. Um, other really quick things, um, just a little bit of housekeeping. We provided uh, the budget forms to department heads. So we are back on track and actually in looking at the calendar for last year, I think we we're actually on track or early comparative to last year. So hopefully we'll stay that way uh, as we build the budget, but I will also put out a calendar for you all and the budget committee uh, shortly and um, you know, really get those meetings dialed in and some of the materials uh, as soon as we have them shared. And one of the things we are also talking about in, as part of the calendar is having a sort of an orientation meeting for the budget committee. Uh, as you all uh, discussed, um, having some of the, the jargon decoded, some of the opportunities to talk about process and, and what is gonna be expected of the budget committee, thinking that we have a few new members. Um, take the opportunity before we really dive into the actual budget presentations uh, with the committee as a whole. Um, so that should come, uh, the calendar will come well before, but the meetings will probably start mid late April for the committee. Um, I participated in the, uh, the league's day at the Capitol, which was online. It was not a, an actual day at the Capitol. Um, some interesting presentations from folks, and uh, I now have a little bit better idea how to uh, access, you know, the bill uh, trackers and all those things being new to the state. So helpful from a, an infrastructure standpoint and also just to see some of the faces and, and learn some of the priorities. 
um, and and meet some of the folks from the league as well and hear what they're working on. Uh, there's a lot of bills out there, I guess, coming from Colorado. I'm not quite as used to the volume of bills that apparently Oregon legislators drop, but um, you know, we'll, we'll pick up on that and figure out some of the, the legislative tracking. We've already talked about doing that as a staff. Um, and then lastly, kind of a question for the uh, council um, around COVID. We are thinking about sending a letter to the county, um, just reminding them that we in Newburgh exist and uh, that we would love to help host um, some of the vaccination clinics and or, you know, would love to make sure that we have our share of vaccinations available to residents, you know, given the senior population and all of those other factors. Um, and so the question of a letter, um, the question of, um, it looks like a letter, yes, and then a question of who, who would send it and if it, you know, the council would like to sign it and send it or if uh, you would like it just to be sent from, from me, it matters not, but I, I just leave that as my last point and, and see what you all think. All right, thoughts on that, folks? I'd love to have a thought. Um, so, on the vaccine pod thought. Um, so Lindsay Manfrin, HHS director, um, has done really, I mean, she's done an incredible job, huge, huge kudos for her of setting up pods throughout the county. And um, Providence is um, the main pod for Newburgh. So um, that I have been quiet about because um, to be quite fair, we have not had vaccine. So um, I don't want to announce anything where we will have to then cancel. We actually did have to cancel our first pod last week and it was really um, devastating. So I'm trying to be quiet about it, although I hear I am announcing it. So it is on Thursdays. Um, it will be Thursdays and we will follow the direction of the county um, in direction of OHA phasing. So um, that will be available to the public, um, not just Providence patients, any community member. Um, we're hoping to really be able to ramp up that number of um, throughput, but it's just going to all be dependent on how much vaccine we can get. So I'm ready to um, throughput as many as we can in a day, um, you know, upwards of 750 potentially. Um, but right now we're just completely dependent on vaccine allocation. So really it would be great for it to go to the, to the county, but honestly, it really should probably be a joint city effort to the state if you're going to write something. Um, because Lindsay will accept any and all vaccine. Um, and it really is a matter of the rural communities not getting the vaccine allocation that we need in comparison to the cities, the big cities. So that's what I would advise is to write a joint letter with other, with other city governments in Yamhill County to OHA. As a thought for that too, Dan, that may be something we could promote with the COG as well. And that way get the tri-county area or the three-county area. Now, the other thing that comes to mind with the rural population, particularly, is uh, some of the most at risk are our farm workers. Um, and th those populations, I'd certainly like to see them be deemed essential workers um, as soon as possible. And I know, you know, it's tricky jumping the line between K-12 and then the age groups. And then now then we're into, um, you know, the essential workers, but certainly farm workers, um, you know, namely in, the, in Polk, Marion and, and Yamhill counties. So. Yeah, so the two seven is the, so it, you know, it is what it is. The OHA has set the phases and we are all, I mean, I'm helping with the convention center in Portland. Like we are taking direction from OHA. So right now we're in one B and we're really focused on one B which is educators in early childhood. So like that is the governor's order and we are full fledged in educators right now to get schools open and a ton of 1A are not done. And it kind of is what it is. And we do not have vaccine to get through it. So um, 1C um, or sorry, one, so 80, 80 and older start on 2-7 and that's happening regardless if we finish educators or 1A. So you're gonna start seeing phases roll into one another. Um, and so what we're, we're really planning on that with the county of doing 80 and above starting on 2-7 because we're hoping that we can get the vaccine and get through it quicker than um, say Portland. So um, it'll be 80 and above, then 75 and above, then 65 and above. And farm workers do fall into that essential worker category. And I know that that's like up front of, of Lindsay's mind of how to get out to the farm workers. So that that's not falling on deaf ears at all. Very good. Um... 
Uh, the other thing, just for just for information's sake, the, the, there was a, a motion sort of made through the COG to try to put in higher education in the K-12 grouping, um, but it uh, basically went nowhere. There, there wasn't enough support. I mean, again, it comes back to that same argument of, you know, the youth versus the, the folks most at risk, the age group. So anyway, but that's just for information's sake. All right. Um, any, other, any other questions for Dan? Um, I just want to add, I guess, uh, Dan, thank you for taking that initiative, especially as someone who's working with the farm worker community and working um, across other counties here, like Clackamas, Marion, and Polk. It seems like um, the rural communities, especially in Yamhill, it, there's been like less communication. And it seems like we're a little bit slower, or not a tr as transparent. And I'm also on the committee with um, Lindsay and a couple other folks from the community um, in terms of vaccine dist distribution. So I think that about equity, it's really important that we you know we're advocating for the community. I think we're forgotten um, through this process. So I just want to say thank you, and also thank you, Elise, for all the amazing work y'all are doing. All right. Anybody else? Any other comments? All right. Um, let's move right. Now. Oh, just one thing, and I, we mentioned this. Um, er, we had a in our run through meeting earlier today. We talked about the idea of of hopefully having James uh, maybe present every once a month on, on what he's working on for the city um, in, and just start to keep us abreast of that kind of thing. Obviously, as we meant, you know, things that are sensitive, sale of property, purchase of land or, or you know, legal issues, of course, we can't discuss that. But, um, and James uh, kindly agreed to, uh, to be able to do that. So, so thank you, James. So we'll look forward to that in the, in the future. All right, um, unless there's anything else, we'll move on to proclamations. All right, um, this is a proclamation recognizing Black History Month in Newburgh. And I'll read this. I'm not sure if I should read all these all the time, but I'm gonna do it until somebody says, don't do it. So there you go. All right. Whereas since the bicentennial year of 1976, Americans of all walks of life have come together during February to honor the too often neglected accomplishments of Black Americans in every area of endeavor through our history. And whereas we recognize the importance of learning not only about the history of our country, but also about the history of Oregon, knowing that Oregon's black exclusion laws prohibited black individuals from being in the state, owning property and making contracts until it was repealed in 1926, thereby creating even more disparity within our communities. And whereas while the observance of Black History Month calls to our nation's attention, the continued need to battle racism and to build a society that lives up to democratic ideals, this year's celebrations and recognition of Black History Month remind us that there can be no peace without justice. And whereas this year's Black History Month comes in the wake of a summer marked by historical protests for a more equitable society, calls for police reform and recognition of how history and privilege has impacted us all. And whereas this Black History Month, we are reminded it is not enough to, be, not, to not be racist, but rather we must work to be anti-racist. And whereas the city of Newburgh is proud to honor the history, contributions, and achievements of black members of our community throughout our state and nation. Now, therefore, in recognition of black individuals past and present in our community, the mayor and city council of Newburgh do hereby proclaim February 2021 as Black History Month and encourage all residents to celebrate the diverse heritage and culture, learn about the contributions of black Oregonians and Americans and continue to the effort to create a world that is more just, peaceful, and prosperous for all. That is the proclamation. So um, I don't know that we necessarily need to vote to approve, but thumbs up or something would probably be good. There we go. There we go. We got it. All right. Thank you all. All right. Now moving right along. Um, committee appointments, the RCA subcommittee formation committee system review. Um, Sue, are you going to take this or did you want me to? You, you may go ahead. It, I think I spelled the, the motion out there. Okay, let me find it. <clears throat> okay, um, and this is per your RCA. Uh, let's see. Recommendation, um, where's your, okay. The council's asked uh, to ratify my motion, the mayor's recommendation to form a council subcommittee of Mayor Rick Rogers, Council President Stephanie Finley and Councilor Denise Bacon for a term of February to September to review the city's committee system and make recommendations to the council for adoption at a future date. So that is the proposed 
Um, res or that is the proposed action. So if you all are in favor, I would entertain a motion. <laughs> Mike. I move that we accept this um, recommendation. Okay. Do we have a second? Second. Second from Elise. Any further discussion? Okay. Hearing none. All in favor signify by raising your left hand. Okay. All right. That is passed. Thank you all very much. All right, we'll uh, we'll get together, figure out these. Will be public meetings, so we will make sure that they're they're announced and all that, and we'll get we'll get going. Uh, Colin's got us on a timeline, so we gotta we're gonna have to go to work. So there you go. All right. Next um, next item: public comments. And this one again, you're gonna hear me read a lot, but I'm gonna read this one too. And this is more for the public than than for all of you. You should have received this uh, this afternoon. Um, so this is for Rob from Robert Suppy to the Newburgh City Council. I would like to raise an issue to the mayor and the four members of the city of the city council who were present at the 1221 meeting. As you may recall, at that meeting, you unanimously approved the resolution to award the city attorney services contract. In the resolution's resolve section was the following item. Number four, the contract is attached as exhibit A. Tonight, I would like to ask those council members to approve the resolution on what basis they approved this item, which was clearly false. As I stated in written testimony delivered well before the council designated deadline, the contract was not in fact attacked as claim in item four. Subsequent communications with the city manager and, the ma and with the mayor have revealed that the council did not even exist at the time that the council approved it with this resolution. Why would the council approve a contract that is not yet, it, that it had not yet because it seen, because it did not exist and falsely claimed that it was attached? There is nothing in the original resolution to address this discrepancy, nor did any council members address it at the meeting, despite it having been raised to their attention. While there's a vague statement about trade secrets, it specifically referred to the rates and not to the contract. The contract, had it existed at the time, could have been attached with the rates redacted. The resolution also makes no mention of excluding either based on the trade secrets claim. Does the council consider it appropriate to approve a resolution with a, with a resolves item that falsely claims to have a contract attached when the contract neither exists nor was attached? I wouldn't have thought so, but five of you apparently considered it acceptable. This is a very great concern to me. Secondly, as I noted in my written testimony, I think that the claim of trade secrets is questionable and does not justify the lack of disclosure without further argument under the ORS mentioned. I'm very surprised that the council felt that this warranted no comment at all. I'd be very curious to hear what legal opinion the city attorney provided to the council on this issue, but no better than to expect a response to that. Thank you for consideration of my comments, Robert Suppy on February 1st, 2021. Okay, so thank you, Mr. Suppy. Thank you for the comments. Um, I will say the the contract the, the contract in question has been posted and does include the rates um, and that's been posted now for a little bit. If anyone, um, either Mr. Suppy or anyone else, would like a link to that, you know, you can send me a note, Rick.Rogers at NewburgOregon.gov, or I'm sure Sue can send it to you as well. Um, anything else on that? Any other comments? Anyone? Okay, hearing none. I believe that is it for. Um, for public comments this evening. Anything on issue tracker, Dan? No, okay. So moving past, um, on to the consent calendar. This, and then again, as I, as I asked, this will be for items 8A and 8C, and then we'll address 8B uh, separately. Well, I just have one question. So um, any word, on, any motion on the consent calendar? Mr. Mayor. I'd like to move that we um, adopt the consent calendar with the exception of 8B. And a second? Second. Second from Jules. All right, all in favor signify by raising your left hands. Okay, that passed unanimously, Sue. All right, so on the question of uh, resolution 2021-3716, my, my only question, um, and I guess it's probably for Dan is, um, on this, it, it's, over, it's over the projected budget amount, but I understand that it will be taken up by contingency for wastewater. And then it said, if not, it would come to us through a supplemental budget. I guess, I just trying to understand the procedure as to how that works or why it goes to either contingency or to the supplemental budget. Is the question like the order or is the question just the, the, like the overage and the, the process to Yeah, pay? the process if you do have something like this when it is an overage, you know, to a budget line item and how that, how that works. 
Yeah, I think, you know, the this one, if I recall, uh, this was, uh, you know, we had essentially had an estimate that was lower and, and it exceeds the plan budget, you know, so I think that there is essentially some savings that will come from another project that is, uh, was overestimated and, and came in under. And so I think that, you know, that will be the reconciliation that would be preferable within the, the departmental budget rather than, you know, having to, to approve a supplemental, um, you know, that it, it all fits within that allocation of uh, the type of expenditure and to that specific department. So I, I think that's, does that make sense as the, the optimal resolution? And I guess Karin can answer if there's a, a more detailed, <laughs> I don't know if, if that answered it or not. Um, sorry, that, yeah, that, that works for me. I was just, again, just trying to figure out more of the process than, than anything else. Um, yeah, so I mean, I, I think ideally we try to take it from that, um, you know, that same department, that same line item or, mm -hmm. or group, if you will, of line items. So it's, you know, you're not taking personnel and moving it into, uh, you know, operations or those kinds of things, but, you know, trying to make sure that you've got, um, you know, we, we do the, the survey of the department. Are there savings that we can use to, to balance this? And if not, then you probably need a supplemental because you've exceeded your, um, your allocation, your um, appropriation. Okay, great. Thank you. All right. That's, uh, that's all I needed. So thank you. I appreciate that. Okay. Yep. All right. Um, with that, would someone like to make a, a motion to approve resolution 2021-3716? Mike. I have a question. Can I ask a question before we sure. to do that? Is this the right time? Okay, so Dan, I was just wondering, is this, uh, we're, we're building a bigger storage area for the sawdust that works into that, is that, is that correct? And if so, how, how long, this extension, how long is that going to put us like into the future? I mean, is it gonna, is it going to, be satisfactory for 10 years down the road, 15 years down the road, where we're looking at seven or eight years. And where are we at right now with our current capacity? Is it almost exhausted? Let me have, it uh, looks like Karin was promoted and maybe she'd be better to answer the, the technical detail on that, if that's all right. Okay, sure. Good evening. Um, yeah, the right now the um, existing sawdust bays are, um, at capacity and have been for a while. We move things around as much as possible out there. This additional, these additional four bays will get us out to for the, at least the next 20 years is, is the goal uh, with these four bays. Okay, great. All right, thank you, Karen. Any other questions or comments, folks? All right, I will uh, accept a, a motion for resolution 2021-3716. Mr. Mayor, I'd like to move that we adopt resolution number 2021-3716. Okay, and second. second. Second from Denise. All right, any further discussion? All right, all in favor signify by raising your left hands. All right, that looks unanimous, Sue, so thank you all. All right, moving on to council business. All right, item 9A, we've got happy birthday traffic safety commission. And I believe Mr. Tony Roos is on the on the line. Tony? Yes, ma'am. Okay. Tony coming to us from a beach somewhere. Right there in the mind, if nowhere else, but it is just a state of mind. <clears throat> So Tony is the chair of the Traffic Safety Commission. And if you haven't successfully taken the pop quiz, it, um, I'll let him explain their history. And then uh, we've got two slides for some of the stuff they've been working on. So when Karen showed me this slide, um, I made the mistake of telling her that TSC was founded before I was born. And she said, her too. So. Uh, I'm happy to know that. Um, so 47 years ago, uh, Traffic Safety Committee was founded and has been doing, reviewing the traffic signs and parking around the city for, for that many years. So Sue, next slide. So our, there's our current commission. 
Um, I took over from Carl Berkey, the big shoes to fill. He was very, very wise. And uh, it's a great group of guys and gals to work with on the committee. It is really fun. This is my first committee. I serve on a, on a few different boards, uh, American Public Works Association. And this is the first one I've ever served on that has a student commissioner. So it's fantastic to have a young high school student on the board with us. Um, it's a completely different point of view. Um, even though I wasn't born when Traffic Safety Committee was founded, Casper has a completely different outlook on things than I do at, at born in 75. So our current issues in front of us today, I think that's the next slide. Oh, that's last, last year's accomplishments. So formalized reporting for traffic issues. Um, Karn was a, and city staff are great in putting that together and putting that on the website. And it's the same as, similar to your issues, Ben, it's something we can go back to and we do go back to every meeting that we're meeting quarterly to review and just see how progress is going, refining the process. Um, since we only meet quarterly, staff is able to make decisions on uh, limited decisions, start the ball rolling with some fixes that we think are pretty straightforward and brings it back to us for final ratification. So it's all been working really well through the issues tracking. Um, Sixth and River make it safer, more line with drivers. I think that's a four-way stop now. The current one we're revisiting is the, the right in or the right out only movement at Sheridan and College. So that's in front of us right now. We're working that issue because people seem to ignore it. And then the, uh, we, we have created a list of our top worst intersections in the city. And at our next meeting, ODOT is gonna come and talk to us about those intersections. So those include 219 and Everest on the backside of, of the Wilco there, or Winco, or um, what used to be the Wilco, now is Grocery Outlet. Uh, the intersection that 240 in Illinois Main Street, that kind of six way intersection that seems to forever having crashes. And then the, the aforementioned uh, Sheridan and College are pretty, our top three. And then inside the city, our, our worst one that we've identified is the intersection of Villa and Mountaintop, a side distance. So we're tracking them, trying to think of ideas and challenging staff to come up with ideas to do some low budget fixes to increase site distance or whatever we can do and then pushing on ODOT to fund the really expensive ones. So that's it for traffic safety. Thank you for having us tonight. All right, well, thank you. And, and uh, you know, happy birthday to the Traffic Safety Commission. And uh, thank you for all you do. Sue, can you, can, is it possible to put the names of, of the committee members back up on the thing? We'll just like to always read them out for the people that are volunteering to do this stuff. Hang on. I'm oh, sorry. <laughs> no, it's just, you know, PowerPoint, right? There we go. All right. Thank you. So for folks who might be listening or may listen later, the current traffic safety commissioners are Tony Roos, the chair, Leslie Woodruff, the vice chair, Roger Coleman, Neil Klein, Sarah Sand, Jeff Greider, Robert Sherry, John Elric, Mark Carlton, Casper Zook, the student commissioner. So thank you all. And thank you to all of those folks who are volunteering their time for the Traffic Safety Commission. So thank you. All right, um, council committee reports. Do we have, oh, sorry. Does anybody have any questions for Tony before I move it quickly along? Sorry about that. Questions for Tony? No, again, Tony, thank you so much. And, and do get to that beach one day, you know, not just in your mind, but- I'll just but keep reading there. this book. Rick or Dan, is that the one you were reading? It's a fantastic book. Call sign chaos. Oh, right. Nice. Call sign chaos. All right. Put that on my reading list. All right. Okay. Um, so thank you, Tony. Thanks so much. All right. Moving on. Council committee reports. Do we have anything to report out, folks? Elise, sorry. This isn't an official committee report, but but it's along the spirit of one of my committees is that we, um, the Newburg Emergency Shelter did open last Friday. So very happy about that. And so um, we will have an official virtual open house probably in about a month. 
um, with key stakeholders that will be invited to do walkthroughs and I'll make sure that the city council all gets an invite for that. So it's going great. I've had a couple hiccups, but to be expected. All right. Anything else, folks? Anybody else? All right. I, yeah, that sounds great. Yes, but Elise, and thank you, you and uh, and Sarah and all for your work on on that. Right. And um, so thank you so much. All right. Um, unless there's anything else, then I have a um, I have a script to read because our next item, I believe, is executive session. So here comes the script. I will now read the announcement card to hold an executive session. After the announcement, this Zoom meeting will terminate and the council will enter into a separate Zoom meeting not open to the public. This, the city council will now meet an executive session for the purpose of consulting legal counsel on current litigation matters. The executive session is held pursuant to ORS 192.662H. Representatives of the news media and designated staff and other persons will be allowed to attend the executive session. No decision will be made in this executive session. At the end of the executive session, the council meeting will adjourn and will not return to open session. All right, so with that, counselors, um, we can sign off of this and then re-log in to the other link that came from Sue, okay? Penny, and we'll see you in just a minute.